the uh, Town Council. My name is Joel Russ. I'm President of the Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to give you a brief uh, description of a planned uh, Casco, Bay, Cay, Casco Bay Bridge uh, opening celebration, which is now planned for the two days uh, over Labor Day, August 30th and 31st. Um, I hope this is one of your least controversial items on tonight's agenda. Uh, for years, the communities of South Portland and Cape Elizabeth and Portland have planned for the eventual replacement of the Million Dollar Bridge. For the last two and a half years or so, uh, commuters to and from Portland and South Portland have been fascinated by the construction of uh, the bridge that's going to replace the Million Dollar Bridge. Uh, it's been a real educational experience for those of us who on a daily basis pass over the Four River. It's, uh, this project is one of the largest, if not the largest, public works project in the state of Maine. Uh, it is unique for several reasons, one of which is that more women have been employed in this public works project than almost any similar project in the United States. And the Maine Department of Transportation has taken special efforts to accommodate uh, those women who work on the bridge by creating, for example, a daycare in the vicinity of the bridge. Uh, that's just one of the more uh, interesting features of, of this uh, bridge construction. Uh, it's also been a very important uh, infrastructure and economic development project. Not only is it bridging two communities, which is symbolically important, but it's also opening up the Upper Four River to increased uh, business development and activity. About a year ago, the Maine Department of Transportation approached the Chamber of Commerce of the Greater Portland Region and asked if we would be interested in coordinating some kind of an opening celebration. Uh, we were happy to do that, but we said we weren't going to do it alone. So we suggested the creation of a community steering committee. So the celebration that you will see and hopefully participate in on August 30th and 31st is the result of community efforts of people of Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, uh, and Portland. It is not the Chamber's project. It is a community project, pure and simple. Uh, now we are ready to celebrate. Uh, I think the Maine Department of Transportation needs to, should be complimented for a superb job of execution on the construction of this bridge. Uh, with very few exceptions, there haven't been major inconveniences to the traveling public. Uh, and that's uh, quite a statement, I think, for the Maine Department of Transportation. Let me tell you a little bit about what's planned for August 30th and 31st. Uh, we were planning, by the way, to have this this past weekend. Uh, and when I think about all the work that goes into an event of this kind, I'm relieved, and I'm relieved that we didn't have to do it last weekend. Uh, Maine Department of Transportation fell behind just a little bit in their construction, construction schedule. And we thought that Labor Day weekend would be appropriate uh, because people would be around the community uh, and available to celebrate, and also because it really was a major uh, effort of labor to construct the bridge. Uh, we put together a st steering committee of representatives from the three, three communities. Um, Phyllis Cogswell is representing the town of Cape Elizabeth, and Peter Ventry, uh, who at the time was president of the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Chamber of Commerce, is also representing those two communities. Uh, we've planned a series of events uh, that begin with a ribbon cutting at 9 o'clock on Saturday, August 30th. There are a series of programs and activities and entertainment scheduled throughout the day, arts and crafts sales, an automobile show, kite flying exhibition, a children's carnival, a marine parade under the bridge, bridge tours for those who are really interested in getting into the kind of the inner workings of the, of the bridge, stage entertainment on both days, and a concluding fireworks display on the evening of August 30th. On Sunday morning at 7.30, or the, the preparations begin at 7.30, there'll be a 5K road race that is co-sponsored by the Cape Elizabeth South Portland Rotary, or the Portland Rotary, and the uh, main junior achievements. Again, arts and craft show, carnivals, and bridge tours will continue. We have raised nearly $100,000 to put on this event, all of which have come from the private sector. Uh, we haven't, uh, nor will we ask the public sector for contributions to this event. 
Um, so it's an entirely pri private sector uh, effort. There will be a raffle that is being coordinated by the uh, Rotary that will permit the lucky winners uh, to be the first to, be, to uh, cross the bridge after the official opening ceremony. We've created enough categories so that a variety of people in a variety of transportation forms will be allowed to cross the bridge from both South Portland and Portland simultaneously and come to the middle of the bridge and have the official opening. We decided on an uh, inexpensive raffle to give everybody in the community the same opportunity to be, be the first to cross so that it won't be an official uh, person uh, who, by virtue of their position, will be walking across. It'll be uh, several citizens of Greater Portland who will have that opportunity. If we're fortunate enough to have excess resources, finances at the end of the project, the three communities will get together and decide how those resources should be appropriately redistributed to the community. So nobody is in this to make money. We're in it to uh, have a good time, have a, a successful, entertaining, and inclusive celebration, and to share our proceeds, if we have any, with the communities who have uh, uh, been part of this construction. Uh, I'm sure that you'll be see receiving more detailed information. I expect that the officials of the town of Cape Elizabeth will ask be, be asked to take a prominent role in the opening ceremonies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Do any councilors have any questions? Very not. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. The next item is review and action upon previous minutes, minutes and meetings one, two, and three. Is there a motion? Um, I'll move that they be accepted as printed. I'll second it. Second. All in favor? Seven to nothing. Um, the next item is appointment of, appointment of town assessor. Councillor Jordan, I believe you were the chair of this committee, and if you could report on that item for us. Thank you. But I didn't know I was the chair, but that's okay. Uh, I have an appointment here that I would like to make. And just a little background, the town had 20 applicants for the position. The town council asked the manager to conduct an uh, initial review of the applicants and narrow it down to three, and then the committee would uh, review the three applicants. Councilor Henry Berry and Carol Fritz, the town manager, and I, with three candidates, two weeks ago, as the assessor's position is appointed to the town, by the town council according to the charter of the town. Only three council members participated in the actual vote of the committee. Nevertheless, we know the town manager fully supports our recommendation. We, as a committee, reviewed the three applicants pretty thoroughly, I felt, and uh, came up with uh, a unanimous recommendation of Robert. Now, if I murder your names, uh, excuse me. Consell? Consell, excuse me. And, uh, he lives in the neighboring community of Scarborough, and I don't hold that against him. As a new assessor, effective today, as the current assessor for both, excuse me, I, he has been a current assessor for both the towns of Waterboro and Long Island, and a certified Maine assessor. He has also done consultant work for the town of Falmouth, Gray, and Cumberland. He serves on the executive, executive committee of the Maine Association of Assessors Office and on the Scarborough Board of Assessment Review. He lives on the family farm in Scarborough with his wife and three children. I don't know what kind of farm it is, but I would want to know if he really works it. And as a follow assessor, a lot of of recommendations, and we had three or four good recommendations as far as Bob is concerned. And assuming his appointment this evening, Bob will begin his full-time work in the town on August 4th in 97. He will also be in office on the 21st and the 28th of July, helping to prepare the annual tax commitment 
which is planned to be completed during the first week of August. Bob's salary is starting salary is $41,500 and will be reviewed in six months according to our pay classification. On behalf of the committee, I'm pleased to recommend the appointment, appointment of Robert A. Gunsell as cable tax assessor. And do we have a, we'll take that as a motion and we have a second I, to that I, motion? I'll second the motion. Councilman Baer. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, we can vote. All in favor? Oh, I'd like to have him stand up so everybody can see what he looks like when they come in. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. The next matter, item 25, um, request from Councillor Berry to terminate and abandon the bicycle pass project for Two Lights Road. I have in front of me this evening for the first time, I just saw, I guess it's in the form of a motion. Um, Councillor Berry? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, first, before I present my motion, I'd like to uh, perhaps rise to a point of order. I was misquoted in the, in the Portland Press Herald of, of Saturday. I just want the people to know that. Uh, they were, they said, uh, I, I supposedly added that my own informal survey showed 30 out of 31 Two Lights Road residents opposed to the bike path. I did not say that. I said there were about 30 uh, homes, residences on the Two Lights Road. I hadn't heard any, uh, to me, opposition uh, to the proposal to abandon it. That's, uh, well, Councilor, I would suggest I would suggest that uh, I just we're at the point. Let me finish. We're at the point where, if in fact you have a motion, I, I would like to have the motion and then have discussion uh, on the motion. Fine. Uh, here's my motion. Whereas, according to information furnished the town by a member of the previous town council, the main department of transportation has determined that the shore road in Cape Elizabeth is the only road in Cape Elizabeth which is classified as Class One which would be hazardous to bicycle traffic. And whereas the majority of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, the previous council, has voted against the construction of bicycle paths on the shore road, and whereas the majority of the taxpaying homeowners on the affected portion of Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, has submitted a written petition in firm opposition to the construction of bicycle paths on Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth, and whereas the original proposed budget for bicycle paths on the Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth was approximately 181,000, and the proposal has since been increased to $261,000. And whereas the construction of bicycle paths along the Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth cannot be accomplished without adversely affecting wetlands and private property, and whereas the widening of the traveled way on Two Lights Road will likely lead to increased speed of vehicular traffic on that dead end way and create a hazard of safety to human life, especially to young children. And whereas the acceptance of funds from sources outside the town of Cape Elizabeth will impose requirements of the takeover of the Two Lights Road by the town of Cape Elizabeth from the state of Maine for maintenance and discontinuance of possible state funding, therefore, and whereas the main intent of the so-called ICE-T legislation was to provide alternative transportation means for group travel and the repair of roads and bridges and not for recreational projects to benefit, uh, benefit a few bicycle riders during only a portion of the year. Now, therefore, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council vote to abandon and terminate the bicycle paths project on Two Lights Road forthwith, disband with Many thanks to the study committee for the plan and dedicate the funds involved to other more essential purposes. Is there a second to the motion? Second? No. Okay. I'll second it. Is there a second to the motion? Discussion? Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to uh, mention, well, I've mentioned the petition. I've submitted a uh, cop uh, the petition uh, to copies to everybody uh, showing that a majority of the persons uh, in the Two Lights Road area uh, affected by this uh, project are uh, opposed to the construction of the bicycle paths along the Two Lights Road. 
I have received some letters which two people have asked me to read into the record. One is from uh, Dr. Richard Sullivan, uh, who uh, is on the Bicycle Path Committee, and he has written to each of the counselors saying, Dear Counselor, please consider these thoughts before your vote tonight on the Two Lights Bikeway. One, will the bikeway improve safety? At each end of the proposed bikeway is a complex intersection which must be crossed by all bikers. Both sites involve blind corners and potentially high-speed traffic coming from three directions. I worry that the bikeway may pose a danger to young and inexperienced riders who must cr ride out across traffic. One fatal accident involving a young biker has already occurred at the park entrance. In my opinion, he says, the simple act of reducing the speed limit would do more to improve safety than with the construction of a bikeway. Number two, he says, who will use the bikeway? He continues, at present, bicycle traffic on Two Lights Road is very sparse in the summer and negligible for nine months of the year. I would speculate that the reason for sparse use is not a perceived like a lack of safety, but the remote location, which is two miles from the town center and nearly eight miles from Portland. I wonder, he says, if a bikeway will substantially increase recreational use, except possibly by children who live on the road. As an analogy, if the town were to build more tennis courts, tennis courts, would more residents play tennis, he asks. Number three, how will the historic and rural character of the Two Lights area be changed if our country road becomes a federal bikeway? And he answers that by saying the world of farmers, fishermen, and historic homes will become a federally mandated environment complete with metal guardrails, distracting signs, and a wide expanse of asphalt encroaching on beautiful old farmhouses. This project, he says, will change forever a beloved rural road, just as the Soya Ficket Road project has changed that area forever. Nearly all the town councilors have pledged to preserve the rural character of the Cape. He puts that in quotes. This becomes an empty promise unless you take a stand on issues uh, such as the one before you tonight. Many preservation er issues involve difficult choices, weighing property rights and government expense. A vote to defeat this project will both preserve the rural character of the Cape and save taxpayers uh, $250,000. Actually, it's about 261, over a quarter of a million dollars in taxes. One more letter, Mr. Chairman, that I have from a resident uh, of uh, Lighthouse Point Road. Has this letter been furnished to the other councillors? Uh, yes. I just got it. Uh, I certainly don't have yeah. it in my packet. I haven't seen this one. All right. Until the, until the other councillors, I would like the other councillors to have an opportunity to see this letter before. I, I just got it uh, this afternoon when I get home. I haven't had a chance to do anything this game with my mail. Um, could we have uh, perhaps uh, someone? Why don't you read it and then we're at, at the conclusion of the uh, uh, tonight. Uh, the town manager can make copies for everyone. All right. Um, what, what you say, reading it now? Go ahead, sir. All right. It's addressed to me. It says, what a breath of fresh air it was to read in the Portland Press Herald of your intention to revisit the subject of bike paths on Two Lights Road at the town council meeting this coming Monday evening. This is dated July 12th. I just got it this afternoon. This note on behalf of my wife and myself is to express our 100% agreement with your opposition to any bike paths on Two Lights Road. Your stance that there is no well-established need for the bicycle path, which would effectively widen the road and take people's property, is right on target. Two additional points that we wish to express are, number one, that there have to be higher priority items ahead of bike paths to spend our tax dollars regardless of matching funds by the government. Two, back to square one. Bike paths or any other developmental project will further contribute to the growing erosion of the rural nature of what was once our nice, quiet little town of Cape Elizabeth just a few years ago. We are 100% with you in your efforts. Keep up the good works and silly yours from Richard McKinley and Virginia McGinley. Um, the town manager has furnished us with some statistics on the standing in Cape Elizabeth on uh, taxes. Uh, out of 400 communities in uh, Cape Elizabeth, uh, our town has a uh, taxes paid on a medium, median home, 
that is the midpoint, I believe, half above and half below, of $3,496 per home, and we are 32nd in uh, tax uh, uh, burden rank uh, of the 400 communities within the state of Maine. That's uh, substantial. Uh, now, the, the financing, uh, $147,000 was, was mentioned as an estimate when this project started some 10 months ago. It increased to $181,000, and now it's up to $261,000. And over a quarter of a million dollars has been proposed for this out of tax dollars without even a final plan. This makes no allowance for po claims and possible lawsuits from taxpayers whose properties are uh, affected by this uh, proposal. And uh, I think that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council should consider the taxpaying residents of the area that is affected by this proposal and not for uh, bicyclists coming eight miles away from Portland or uh, any other consideration than those taxpaying residents who in uh, majority are against this proposal. I note that the, uh, the meeting, uh, well, it's, uh, according to the um, material furnished us in our, in our packet by the manager, uh, we have minutes of the first meeting of the Design Review Committee, which was held on uh, July 9th. And uh, the Design Review Committee, I believe, was uh, formed, uh, well, this, the vote on this was taken last September, September 9th, so it, it's taken 10 months for the first meeting to occur here. Uh, and uh, and uh, there were certain representations made at that time of the, the vote, which I feel the uh, suggestions of the committee do not uh, uh, comply with, although we have not been presented with the final plan. So the proposal to expend over a quarter of a million dollars without even yet having a final plan, I think is an unworthy project, and I believe that it should be abandoned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other councilors? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Reed. Thank you. As a member of the P2 committee and the town council member who made the uh, motion that prevailed on September 9, 1996, and in light of the disinformation and misinformation in the uh, motion that was presented for us tonight, I move uh, tabling of this item until after the design uh, committee has completed its work as directed by the town council in prior motions. Sir, second to the motion to table. We have a motion. On the yes, but the motion to table over overrules procedurally it, all it, other it motions. Definitely. No. A month. Until the committee reports back as uh, requested originally. If there's a, just so we are all understand, if there's a second on the on this motion to table to a finite time, there can then be discussion, uh, but only on the motion to table as it relates to when they would be reporting back. That would be the limit of the discussion. If in fact. There is a second on the motion to table. That is the only discussion that would be permitted prior to a vote on the motion to table. Is there a second to the motion to table? The chair will second the motion to table. Discussion on the time frame upon which uh, the motion, uh, upon which, on so a second, a discussion on the time that we would then take up this item again. Is there any such discussion? Mr. Chairman, my reason for bringing forward this proposal at this time is that uh, if the council is not in favor of this project, as the citizens who live in the road are not, then I think that uh, before anybody's time is wasted, it would be well to cut it now. However, if the council wants to uh, uh, postpone that decision, then uh, that's the council's decision. I just don't like to waste people's time if it's not going to be uh, productively spent. That's all. Is there any other discussion on the time frame concerning the motion to table? Councilor Jordan. Where is the committee at this point? Have they reviewed this and ready to make a report? Do you know? Call on the town manager to answer that question. 
the committee has met once, uh, has a second meeting scheduled, we'll probably need a third meeting. Uh, the hope is to do them all in about the next six weeks. Uh, the, they looked at this plan that you see here at their, their last meeting. As the minutes indicate, they have a number of areas that they'd like the engineer to go back and look at. Uh, and the engineer uh, will be reporting back to them uh, at the next meeting. In my sense, there'll probably still be a, a few remaining issues uh, that they'll need to deal with at a third meeting. So it's, it's liable to be a couple of months or more? It'll probably come back to the council. Uh, my guess would be at your September meeting. September? It could be October, but I think it's more likely to come back in September. Mr. Chairman, am I allowed to bring up a couple of comments that bother me with this project, seeing that we're just voting on the time schedule? No. You can discuss the time schedule, and you can count your, couch your comments if uh, to addressing the time schedule, if that is appropriate. Well, I don't think I can put it with a time schedule because I'm disturbed at the letter from the state, and I think the people should know what it says because there's two or three incorrect. In the, in the original motion you'd wish to discuss? That would have been in the original motion, yes. Well, if, in fact, uh, Councillor, you're suggesting that the time frame would be appropriate, uh, that time frame being the end of the study period for this committee, because that would allow disinformation in this particular motion to surface and allow the opportunity for public opinion uh, to come forth and allow the further dissemination of information that would be uh, necessary for this council to adequately represent the citizens of this town, that would be appropriate comment. <laughs> <laughs> my, my comment won't be as long as I. Is there any? Good. You got two other. Is there any other discussion? Yes, on the other side. Uh, I'm wondering about the, the expenditure of funds between uh, how much has been spent in design studies and how much we might spend between now and the time they expect to be finished and report to the council. And I assume this is, uh, uh, you're, the reason you're asking this question is to evaluate whether the time period is appropriate. Right. Uh, I would address that question to the town manager. My sense is that in, in the time period from this evening to the next report to the council, we're looking at about an additional $5,000 in cost. Uh, the, the current expended to date is uh, just under 30000 It's 29 and change. All right, is there any other discussion on the motion to table? Councilor McGinty. Um, I originally voted against this um, the bikeway in the first place. And I've seen nothing so far to change my mind. However, I think I can wait the two months, that time frame, to see the report back from the committee before we take a final act on it. So um, I can support the motion to the table with a, about a two-month time frame. Any other discussion on the motion, the, the time frame concerning the motion to table? I hope this has to do with the time frame, but I, I tend to oppose spending the federal money and along with the requirements to have a four foot wide path. So I'd rather that the, say $5,000 or any additional money be spent in terms of maybe redesigning it in Cape Elizabeth's fashion rather than the federal government's fashion. Well, I, I would respectfully suggest that perhaps that is outside of the t discussion here because the idea if that's even possible to uh, attract federal dollars without uh, a federal mandate is, is a, the subject of another discussion, and I would suggest yeah. that we don't open that door, and it would not be appropriate mm -hmm. at this point in time on the motion to uh, current motion pending. That was not my intent, that we would attract further federal dollars. Councilor Reed. I just have a comment. Um, Mr. Chairman, in light of the fact that this original proposal came um, after a public hearing, isn't it appropriate to allow the two-month period for, uh, again, public hearing and not allow um, an item of this magnitude to uh, have an action taken without uh, appropriate notice? Um, 
I assume that's a comment that you're making as a discussion in favor of uh, the motion, the time period set forth in the motion to table. Would allow for the general public to know of the um, motion to kill the project. It certainly is uh, your comment. Is there any other discussion? Uh, I would not object to uh, continuing for a period of time if that's uh, the council's wish. My reason for bringing it forward at this time, I've already stated that I don't uh, join Councilor Fritz in saying I don't think we should continue to spend a lot of money uh, in tax money if we're not uh, going to go through with the whole thing. And uh, if we do, then it's against the wishes of the residents who are going to be affected. So uh, I would not object tabling for that purpose for a couple of months. Is there any other discussion on the motion to table? Councilor Jordan? Well, I'm, I'm in favor of tabling it, but I think there's information here that the public should know and be thinking about in the meantime. That's all. Does that information relate to allowing a time frame of when to report back? No, no, it doesn't. Is there any other discussion? Carrying nine to call votes. Uh, ask for a roll call vote. For, for, could you read the motion for two months? Uh, would you read the motion back in the motion to table? The motion to table, as I understand it, which was um, moved by Councilor Reed and seconded by Chairman Groff, was to table this item until the committee reports back to the town council. And I believe the town manager gave an estimate of when that report back would be. Should be September. But, but there is no, the motion does not say September. The motion says when the committee completes its work and reports back so that there's nothing binding on the town manager's uh, statement. He's just estimating of when it would be in September. But that is not, uh, that is not part of the motion. May I move to mo amend the motion to set uh, September 30th as a deadline? only with the consent of the individual who made the motion. Do you con so consent? Uh, no. Do you want to know why? No, then you may not. Um, that uh, uh, discussion is closed. And the motion has been read. Uh, I'd ask for a roll call vote on the motion to table. Matt, the clerk, please. Councilor Barry. Yeah, I'll, I'll. Councilor Byer. Yes. <coughs> Councilor Fritz. Yes. Councilor Jordan. Yep. Councilor McGinty. Yes. Councilor Reed. Yes. Chairman Groff. Yes. Vote seven to nothing. Um, the matter is tabled until the report comes back from the committee to the town council. Item 26, action upon recommendation to change name of Angel Terrace to Stone Drive. I'd ask the manager to comment on this item. Yes, within the city of South Portland, they had two streets. One is Angel Avenue, one is Angel Terrace. I think some of you may have read in the newspaper the last couple of days about an incident on Angel Avenue. Uh, so it, it gets confusing as to what street to go to. Uh, the city of South Portland, working very, very closely with the Cape Elizabeth residents, uh, on Angel Terrace uh, have recommended that we change the name of Angel Terrace in Cape Elizabeth to uh, Stone Road. Uh, the street actually begins in South Portland. We just have uh, a number of homes at the end of the street. Most of the street is, in fact, uh, in the city of South Portland. Is there a motion? Councilor Reed. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we change the name of Angel Terrace to Stone Drive. Second. Any second. Any discussion? Are there any objections? I'm sorry? Uh, did anybody uh, who lives there object to the change of the name? No. To, to the contrary, it was the residents on the road who came up with the name. Oh, no, no objections. No. Thank okay. you. Councilor Fritz. I, I would suggest that we um, have the people on the road discuss a different name. It seems to me this, the, town, uh, the city of South Portland is attempting to change the name because they have a couple of streets with Angel in it. Um, 
we would be then having streets with quite a few streets with stone in them. Um, I mean, we have Stonegate, Stonebridge, Stony Brook, and we'd be adding Stone Drive. I think we would be creating confusion within the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I, I can let the manager respond to that, but I would point out in his memo to the council, he indicated while we would not choose we would not have chosen Stone Drive. I respect the desires of the citizens on the road and the fact that they probably went ahead and ordered stationary and arranged address changes based on what had been announced by South Portland and the Postal Service. Does the town manager wish to comment any further? No, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to uh, Councillor Fritz's comment. Uh, we would not have chosen this name. I think the difference, though, you get like an Angel Street, an Angel Road, an Angel Terrace is a little bit different than a, a stone road, a stone street, a stone avenue. Um, you know, our preference would be that we not have stone at all, but, you know, it, it's, I, I just hate to put the citizens through all that. Well, I, I, no. <laughs> Councillor Jordan. Well, so we have no choice, is what you're saying. Yes, you question. have a choice. You could say no, and then we would reopen discussions with the city of South Portland and with those residents. And, uh, you would be dealing with the situation uh, in an upcoming month. Because I agree with, with Councillor Fritz. I had the same idea down here to bring forth that you have too many stones anyway in the game. So I'd be against it. Any other discussion? Just a comment that I live on a street that has uh, duplication in the town, and it gets very confusing with mail. Uh, I think we, there's can be confusion if there were a fire on the street. I, I think it's an important um, thing. Any other discussion? Hearing none, call the matter to a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Five to two. Approved. Item 27, request to amend sewer service area to add one improved lot on Wells Road. I'd ask the town manager to comment on this item. Yes, so along Wells Road, uh, where the Dominicus Crossing approved subdivision now is going to be, there, there is a single lot that is surrounded by that subdivision. It, the property owner uh, in that has requested that that be allowed to connect to the sewer just as all uh, the great predominant amount of numbers of the lots in uh, Dominicus Crossing have the right to connect to the sewer. And because it's only one lot, it, it would not tax the uh, uh, capacity of the treatment plant. And I think as one looks at the map and just sees that little uh, area there with the the larger area, it, uh, does not have a substantial impact on the sewer system. The resident fully favors this and is here should you have any questions. Is there a motion? I move approval of it. A second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion uh, on this motion? Council Fritz. I, I think we, I mean, I can see that this, this is a single lot in the middle of an area that's been approved, but I think there was rhyme or reason to how the ordinances were drawn up, that you would not have little connections along the way of a sewer line. You would take a sewer line directly to a housing development that received approval through the planning process in this growth control area. Um, I, I would urge you to think about what happens when a couple of these uh, of other contiguous lots that are larger come in and ask for the same considerations and same approval and that you want to be consistent. And there really was a reason for excluding because the ordinances specifically exclude areas that are not contiguous to the existing service area, not this area, but the existing service area or anywhere along the route. Um, so consider consistency and how you would approach somebody else asking for approval. And there are other lots along the way that could, that could happen. Is there any further discussion? 
I just want to ask you, Councilor Byer, Councilor Fritz, a question. I, would you elaborate a little more on that? Why, would, why, for instance, would it have been planned in a way as to leave out a contiguous site? And also elaborate, perhaps, is the expense to be borne by the individual to connect? Or well, I, I want to understand your point a little bit. Well, the, the ordinances say that that this there wouldn't be anyone allowed to connect from the existing a sewer connecting particularly for the growth area of town, which is what this is, um, without specific approval by the planning board, as this was. Um, so you're, you're not supposed to connect when it's not contiguous with the existing area, unless another reason that you could is if you had a malfunctioning septic system. Um, and if you would not just have to correct it, but if you would have to go for a variance to the state so that it was a very serious malfunction. I don't know if that's the case, and I would be interested in hearing from the person who's proposing this. And it would be at the expense of the lot owner. And it also says that it has to be built in accordance with the requirements of the sections in the ordinance. Any further discussion? Councilor Jordan. Yes, I'm a little lost on this. I just don't understand that if the sewer is going up by a place and because it isn't uh, connected with the development, so therefore I couldn't hook up. Is that correct? I couldn't hook up. Are you going to increase my valuation because it's a sewer on that road when it goes up by? Is that a question for the town manager? <laughs> yes, I'll pass it. Um, is this a hypothetical, or are you asking about you in particular? <laughs> <laughs> I think I wasn't going to speak because I thought it was a conflict of interest. But so uh, it's going up the road, and if, and if the sewer goes up the road, you're going to increase my valuation, but I couldn't hook into so well, why don't I don't I'll, understand. I'll treat this as a hypothetical situation. Uh, generally, if a sewer uh, Generally, property values are determined by their, their market value in the community and the value of land. We've generally found in this community most homes, whether they're on sewer or not on sewer, uh, have similar values. Uh, the differences are when, if there is a particular home that uh, has a fun malfunctioning system, then it, then it definitely has a negative value. In the case of this particular sewer connection, uh, as Mrs. Fritz points out, the ordinance for the section reads, as you extend it all the way down to Spurrink Avenue, uh, they're not allowed to connect unless there's some other policy change by the council. Uh, did this look like it was a special exception because it's actually totally surrounded by it, including it front and back and each side. It's not like the language in the ordinance that reads as it passes down the road. That's a hypothetical response to your hypothetical question. Thank you. Uh, my, you didn't answer the assessment. Uh, I, I always try to avoid answering those <laughs> comments. You know, it's the assessor. I know what's going to happen. The assessor looks at those things, and uh, I don't know the way he's going to tax your land. He was just appointed tonight, and I'm not going to put him on the spot. <laughs> Could I ask Mike one more question, please? Then, Mike, are you are you saying that because of the uniqueness of this situation, that you think that Carol's point may not apply and it would not set a precedent? I, I think Councillor Fritz's point does apply. However, I think this is a fairly narrow precedent in the fact that the lot is totally surrounded by a growth area and in, in the fact that it is already an improved lot whereas i think you know that there was the, the suggestion but maybe it wasn't she didn't directly say that you know a lot of the other thing would be opening up you know vacant land for possible development this is a place with an existing home uh with an existing septic system that that is of, a, of an age that uh you know if, if ms van van Wy were to sell the property or even live there, it certainly is ad advantaged by the fact that it could possibly hook to a sewer. She, she's not saying, and nowhere in this proposal does it say, that it will be hooked to the sewer. What it does say is that should the need arise, that this would have the available, availability to it so that, you know, this is sort of planning ahead when, when the system fails, uh, this would definitely be an option uh, to look at. It's, there aren't any immediate plans to connect to this. That was answering the question. And then, any further discussion? Councilor Reed. Yes. 
I would um, say that I wanted to commend the uh, person who brought this forward at this time and that it is timely and that um, since the comprehensive plan is 10 years old, uh, no offense, but it could not project everything that would be going on in Cape Elizabeth um, as we come close to the end of the 1990s. Um, I would like to make a motion. I, I believe there's well, a motion. I, we have one. A motion. I, I meant that we move. Move the, move the question? Yes. Um, I think that ends discussion anyway, so I think that question is that, that the motion is quite timely. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Opposed? Six to one. Councillor Fritz voting against. The Next matter, uh, next two items are on the consent agenda. Uh, are the, the two items are approval of annual local road certification, it's item 28, item 29, approval of water main location on Hunts Point Road. Is there any counselor who wishes either item removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none. Uh, uh, Councilman McGinty. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Both items are approved. Final item this evening, uh, citizens' uh, discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there any such discussion by any citizen? Very none. Uh, that portion of this meeting is closed. The uh, there will now be a. I assume there will now be a motion for executive session. I should indicate to the public that it is not anticipated uh, that the council will come back into public session this evening. Other than to adjourn. Other than to adjourn, that's correct. Uh, is there a motion concerning executive session? Councillor Jordan. I have one comment that I would like to throw out before I move to go into executive session. And my comment is for 28 and 29 for the local road certification in the water main and Hunt Point Road. You have people sitting here, and I think maybe they got all that information, and maybe they understand it. But I don't quite agree with this consent agenda in that type of an item now. I don't know if they all feel that I'm way off base. Give me a ring. My wife will answer the phone. Thanks. I move to go into executive session. Well, before you do, Councillor, I, I should say that to the, so the public understands the consent agenda uh, are simply items where there appears to be no controversy at all and there hasn't been an indicated need for discussion. Each and every counselor has the right to request that any particular item, any or all the items on the consent agenda, be pulled off the consent agenda and discussed uh, individually. And I would hope that any counselor who feels that there is an item on the consent agenda that needs to be discussed in any way will feel free to make such a motion. And uh, the chair will do all that it can to recognize that counselor and make sure that that item is pulled off the consent agenda and fully and adequately discussed to that counselor's satisfaction. Now, with, uh, with that said, Councillor Jordan, I believe you indicated uh, you had a request for executive session. Uh, and is there a specific purpose, sir? Oh, information relating to land acquisition slash disposition yeah. uh, issues. Is there a second to that motion? Second. 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 All in favor? Seven to nothing. Uh, that ends the... Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I did want to point out that tonight also you'll be receiving a brief update uh, in having the annual meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Museum at Portland Headlight, which, you know, it's a public board and it's a public issue. 
And what I might suggest, to keep, so Cheryl doesn't have to wait, and since it won't take too long, and since the public may be interested in, in the topic, is that you, you recess as a council uh, before you go into executive session so Cheryl could come to the podium and, and present the report. That way everyone else could hear the, the fine things happening at the Lighthouse. And uh, then you, as, as you went to the, as you finish uh, with the annual meeting of the Portland Headlight, then you re reconvene as the council, but they, that you recess in order to have your annual meeting of Portland Headlight so that there's no sense that that's being done uh, other than fully publicly. Is that acceptable to the other councilors? That's okay with me. I just wish they'd been on the agenda. Well, hearing no objection, um, then my understanding is that uh, we would be publicly, publicly recessing at this point in time, but uh, I would ask that the uh, TV stay on the air uh, and televise the report concerning uh, the lighthouse. Before Cheryl uh, comes up, why don't you come up, Cheryl? Uh, one of the issues that you need to do is to elect the chairman of, of the 501c3 corporation by the bylaws of the museum, the Portland Headlight. It, it provides that that person is the council chairman. So I thought we did one. You didn't do it because you, you decided to talk us with it and actually vote it because we weren't meeting us. Well, we're out of session. You're in, no, you're meeting a full time like Oh, we're in a full time session as the 501c3 corporation. And this is a member of the whole. It's a committee of the whole. I left it off. Just so the public understands, evidently, uh, Portland Headlight is a committee of the whole made up by the councilors. We are technically in that meeting right now. That's right. And that's, uh, it is, although it is necessary to elect the chairperson, uh, the chairperson is. Uh, Traditionally, by the bylaws, I guess, is the town council chairperson? That's right. There should um, be a motion by this group to that effect. Is there such a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? And secondly, during an earlier council caucus, when they were, you were doing the council organization, uh, you determined to recommend to this board of trustees that the vice chairman of the Museum of Portland Headlight would be Councillor Henry Berry. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Seven and nothing. So. You, you also uh, need to annually elect the trustees of the 501c3, and that would be a committee of the whole council. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Seven and nothing. You need to annually elect the secretary of the corporation, and, and that secretary would be Cheryl Parker. Uh, with Deborah Lane as the Assistant Secretary. Is there a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Done. <laughs> you also need to elect the Treasurer of the Corporation. Uh, the Town Manager uh, serves as the Town Treasurer, has also served as Treasurer of the Corporation. The Deputy Treasurers are Scott Poulin and Deborah Lane. Uh, Barbara? Barbara. And Barbara uh, Ray. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? We're on a roll. Did I forget anything? This isn't rigged. We should have started with Cheryl. No, I, I don't. Cheryl Parker, anyone does everybody. know her, I think everyone does, is the director of the museum at Portland Headlight, and she's here to update the council. Well, I didn't think it was going to be this formal, but uh, it's okay. I guess I know it pretty well. Um, last year was another great year at the Lighthouse. Uh, it continues to astound me. Our sales came in, the projected sales were $250,000, just so everybody knows. Uh, I wanted to project them at two hundred seventy, dollars but Michael wouldn't let me because he didn't want me to be disappointed. <laughs> but uh, I said, well, then that will be my private goal. And the sales for the period ending June 30th, uh, 1997, were $288,613.39. So that's uh, pretty good for a little shop. That's the size of a two-car garage. Uh, we had a 7.3% increase over the previous year, which was an astounding year. And we have continued to grow. 
I think we pretty much are at maximum. I said that last year, but I, I believe it now. I, I don't think we can work any harder, really. And uh, I think that it'll level off at around um, 285, right around there. The admissions for the first time in five years have met my budget projections. I have uh, been projecting $30,000. I believe that the museum should take in $30,000. And it did this year. Uh, it exceeded the projection by $857. We have about 18,000, a uh, uh, few more than 18,000 people that come through the museum. And almost every day there are people from out of the country, not just out of the New England seaboard here, or uh, the eastern seaboard, but com completely out of the country. We have just a wide range of people that we attract, and I, I think that that is um, due to the fact that we're widely publicized and that we appear in ads all over the world, including Japan, where they use us as a background for automobile ads. Um, all of this couldn't be possible without my volunteers. I have 56 regular volunteers and a few people that fill in, so the staff is close to 60 as far as volunteers are concerned. And the volunteer hours for this year I haven't added up yet, but I will soon. Uh, last year, though, volunteer hours were 36, exceeded 3,600 hours of volunteer time for the museum and the shop. The um, staff, we run everything with part-time people. I have um, a shop, two shop assistants. One is seasonal. One works a little more than just in season. And I have an um, assistant that works 24 hours a week, year-round. We are now computerized fully, including the shop. Uh, we have a scanner, very professional. It's a long way from the muffin tin and writing everything down, although we had to revert to that last uh, week because the tower was hit by lightning the uh, 3rd of July, and it um, knocked our computers out. So we needed to be open, so we just wrote everything down. It took forever, but uh, we still had some pretty good days. And we had to do that today when we lost electricity, too. So we always have a backup program. You just pull out the petty cash box. And write everything on a piece of paper. and Then when the computer comes back on, you just put it all back in. Uh, we've done some improvements to the property this year. We uh, repainted and fixed the fence, the chain fence. Uh, it needed to be, have a lot of work done to it, actually. It's all done. It looks really great. The um, uh, garden club has continued to provide the work and the manpower and everything, actually, to making the garden down there look great. So there are a lot of people involved in the effort to make the property look good and uh, so that tourists and all of us can enjoy it. That was about what I had to, uh, to say. Um, it's a really positive project, as you all know. Everybody who works down there feels like they're showing off their own house, their own yard. Uh, there's a lot of pride of place. And um, the people who come through seem to be very envious of the fact that we work in such a beautiful place and have such a beautiful place in our community. And uh, then they buy things, and it makes it even better. <laughs> Thank you. If you have questions, I would take them, but... Uh, Councilor Reed. Um, I would just like to commend you for your continued wonderful efforts. I did have a question regarding the centennial celebration and the activities that mm -hmm. may be going on soon. How will that impact your limited space? Uh, have you thought about anything that you're going to be able to do or going to need to accommodate the anticipated increase in use of the fort, more visitors, et cetera? Or is it too early for that? Bigger yet? sales. No. <laughs> uh, no, I think, uh, I think we, we adjust. You know, every year is different. 
and you just keep adjusting for the situation. It's better because technology makes it easier, um, makes it more organized for us, and uh, certainly if we needed to bring in more volunteers, the volunteers are out there. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that, but no, I'm, I welcome, <laughs> I welcome more business. I, I assume Councillor Reed's uh, comment also goes to the fact that is it perhaps anticipated um, that as an adjunct to our celebration that it is possible the shop might have some unique merchandise that is geared toward helping our visitors and our citizens uh, celebrate also by uh, perhaps buying an item that uh, reflects the centennial. Yes, well, so a couple of things come immediately to mind. Um, a hat, number one, and uh, a walking tour of the fort. And I think both of those things, well, the hat is easy. You just, <laughs> just get a design and call up a company and you've got it. A uh, walking tour of the fort, though, I think would be really good. Um, and I think we could give walking tours of the fort for a fee and then give out the pamphlet as part of that. I think that that would be uh, a good way to... Um, help, you know, to celebrate and to bring the history to life, really. But yeah, there's, there's no problem with selling things there, um, as long as they are tastefully designed. Yes, I would certainly want to see the design, but, uh, but the opportunity is there, yes. Sorry, are there any other questions? No coffee mugs. Any other discussion, any other questions? We can do coffee mugs. Thank you. On behalf of the on behalf of the uh, Portland Headlight Board, which we are acting as now, and on behalf of myself as chair, thank you very much for the, the hard work of both you and, and your staff and also the many, many people in Cape Elizabeth who volunteer. And this is, uh, uh, this is what makes this community so much fun to live in and so rewarding is that we have so many people that are willing to help out, and this is a prime example. So thank you very much. Thank Second that motion. Is there, a, at this point in time, a motion to adjourn the meeting of the Portland Headlight uh, Board? So moved. Council Reed, a second? Second. second. All in favor? Uh, council now will go into executive session. And again, uh, for members of the public, it is not anticipated that we will convene again in public session except simply to adjourn. Thank you very much. Yeah.